All right, if anyone has a question or a comment that you'd like to make, whether you're here or listening on Pal Talk, if you're listening on Pal Talk, you can enter your question or comment into the text and Bob will relay it to us. But why don't we start with Louisa? Good morning. My first question is, I have two questions. The first one is, what's the benefit of church people receiving the track or being informed about what we have learned? Church people or the people in the world who are not saved, but first of the church people. Well, you, you know, uh, when we're talking about the Bible, the Bible is always a blessing it, to, to everyone. In um, Hebrews 11, we read of Jacob, no, not Jacob, was it? Um, Isaac, in, in verse 20, uh, Hebrews 11, 20, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. So Isaac was their father, and Jacob and Esau were his sons. We know one was saved, and the other was not saved. And God made choice of who to save before the foundation of the world. Uh, but he also revealed to Rebekah who he would save and before they were born. And yet Isaac blessed both his children. How did he do that? By speaking the word of God and declaring what the Bible says. And it's still possible for people to um, live to some degree in accord with the things the word of God says as far as um, observing the commandments in certain areas. If anyone does that, saved or unsaved, it'll be a blessing to them. So we want to always share truth with people and 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 if someone's in the church, they can make it known if they're not interested. And they can say, well, don't don't talk to me about that. And then we uh, we just honor their requests and we don't bring it up. We don't try to force it on anyone. But uh, there is nothing wrong with sharing information with that person. Now, you now you might share something with that person and that person shares it with two or three of their friends and maybe someone else along the line is one of God's elect who then hears um, about Judgment Day and, and so forth. So that person who happens to be a child of God, an elect, then that person wouldn't have be, been in church then? No, have... no, I'm not saying the individual in the church is elect. I'm saying that, that we don't distinguish. When we're handing out tracts, it's not a problem. We just hand it to everyone. Mm -hmm. We we don't uh, say oh oh, um, and sometimes you could do this on Sunday when someone's coming towards you well dressed and suit and a tie. They're coming from mm -hmm. church, so no, we don't hide it and we don't make that kind of decision. We hand it to everyone, and okay. let God take care of it. Yeah, but the surprising thing is, like sometimes they seem to be interested. And yet they go to church, <clears throat> or they go to church because the wife goes to church. So what's that person's... Well, um, all we can do is tell people the day we're living in. We can tell people the church age ended. Mm -hmm. This is what the Bible teaches. No one was saved in any church during the 23-year Great Tribulation period or after, and no one could become saved after May 21, 2011. Mm -hmm. Now that may convict them. They might say, well, I was in a church. We just say what the Bible says. The word of God will convict who God wants to be convicted, and we leave it at that. We're, it's not us pointing any finger at anybody, and we're, we're not doing that. We just we share what the Bible teaches. Okay, now what do you think of a church that have no membership? They are like... Uh, you know, let's say, for example, Calvary Church, you know, uh, they don't have membership. People come and go, but they have a lot of regulars for years. What, uh, what do it, you think? Um, Is that, but they have like church. Lord's Supper. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a church. They're operating as a church. And they the, baptize the judgment people, of God but no fell membership. upon them. Um, 
and, and whether they had a membership or not, they had a church, they had pastors, elders, deacons, mm -hmm. they had the ceremonial laws, mm -hmm. and, and therefore um, the wrath of God was upon them. Oh, so people who go to attend, even though they, they have no membership, they, they will be... That, well, that's... Um, Their heart no, is... It's not the point. They were a church. God mm -hmm. commanded his people, come out. Okay. Depart from the church. Okay. Now, my second question is, I uh, remember hearing Brother Camping on open forum. He was uh, giving an answer to uh, a listener, um, and he seemed to think that the gospel will end in China. So when you're, if you're going that direction starting mm -hmm. October next month, mm -hmm. that could justify it. What, what but do you I don't mean, know why he says... Excuse me, what do you mean the gospel will end? I just assume that when the gospel opens up in China, maybe that's the end of it. That, I, that's what I understand from what he meant. He said. But Family Radio was broadcasting into, into China, China yeah. yes. for quite a while yes. leading maybe, up to May 21, maybe that's why. Maybe that's why he reached and out that, that direction too. Maybe. Well, I, I will say this, mm -hmm. that... If uh, you've ever been at the family radio conferences in years past, mm -hmm. where, where the banquets, the day in the words, often Mr. Camping would, uh, in explaining the latter rain, he would point out the many doors that God had opened. Mm -hmm. God opened up doors with short wave, mm -hmm. and you know they would recount that story of moving the translators from Massachusetts to Okeechobee, Florida. God opened up doors um, with international ministry in many different ways. And always the biggest and, and sort of like the brightest star to, to illustrate the latter rain was the transmitter that was located in Taiwan that broadcasts into mainland China and much of Asia. Mm -hmm. And you could mm -hmm. tell when Mr. Camping would talk about it how awed he was that God opened up that opportunity. And he would even mention how the Chinese blocked uh, practically every other signal, but not that signal from that translate from uh, Radio Taiwan into mainland China. Mm -hmm. and, and he was correct. Mm -hmm. God opened up a great door and effectual for the latter rain, and the gospel went out into all the world, and even in communist China, the word of God went forth, and God saved, uh, I'm sure, many Chinese as part of the great multitude. And yet now, here we are after May 21, 2011. What happened on May 21, 2011? Judgment Day? Yes, but what else? The Great Tribulation concluded, and the latter rain was falling simultaneously with the Great Tribulation. So the latter rain ceased. That great and effectual door that we saw, we were witnesses to how God opened up information to all the world, was closed. Mm -hmm. It shut. Mm -hmm. And and so it was it was no wonder that we started hearing of radio stations being sold. Even our own local 106.9 mm -hmm. went off the air for a while. The one in New York uh, um, and others. And Family Radio Shortwave Facility in Okeechobee, Florida was sold to um, Miami businessmen. The Family Radio let go of the lease of the station that they had built in Taiwan to broadcast into mainland China, and they no longer broadcast into China. Why? Why? It fits perfectly, and not to mention no track trips, not a one, and, and it fits perfectly with what God did. There was a time to sow, a time for the latter rain, mm -hmm. to bring forth the fruit, and then it was completed, so those open doors began to close, one mm -hmm. after another after another, and the Ministry of Family Radio is shrinking. 
But it's also interesting at the same time, e-Bible is growing, that we're well, getting bigger, mm -hmm. that God um, does not have family radio broadcasting a gospel that God is still saving in the mainland China, but he allows e-Bible, uh, uh, talk about a little nobody, uh, an internet ministry to have access to the very same people group and to broadcast a very different message though. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think we can see, I'm just using that as an example, that God, if, if anyone is trying to minister seed as though God is still saving, God's not with them, mm -hmm. but he will help. Mm -hmm. Although it's, it's a little help, he will help um, his people throughout this time period to reap because that's the program now. It's no longer sowing seed. It's to reap what has been sown. Okay, by the but way, thank you. Thank by the you way, the, is it going to be in English or in Chinese? Chinese in Chinese, Chinese, translated. Yes. And also there are other ministries uh, from that station to Indonesia and to Philippines. Yes. So are they going to um, be ministered to also? What, Those what Indonesia. Do you, what do you mean other stations? No, same station not only broadcast to China, but to Indonesia and we Philippines. Have, we do have um, some opportunity uh, if we're able to Is that another? develop the language programming and um, get the financial resources where right. we can so that will be different funding. In other languages. There'll yes. be different fundings then. Yes. Because I asked Mr. Camping for the Philippine ministry, so apparently it's cut off. You know, uh, I, then, then yeah, it, I'm sorry, yeah. I, uh, I, I don't know yeah, much more. So everything would have you. to be cut off from that much, station, Louisa. right? Okay. We're going to see if there's a question on Palta. The question is, would you kindly explain the difference between the sin talked about in Deuteronomy 24:16 and the sin or traditions passed down through time in Deuteronomy 5:9? where God <clears throat> speaks to visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Deuteronomy 24, 16. It says, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. And Deuteronomy 5, 9 um, thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, Jehovah, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Well, I, I, I do know that God uh, deals individually with every person, that um, we're all accountable. Each person is responsible for their own sin, even the baby in the womb, because the baby in the womb sins, and, and God says uh, they're conceived in sin, born speaking lies, and if a baby dies, what hap an unsaved baby dies, what happened? What happens to the child? It's destroyed like anyone else due to their sin. And they, the, the unsaved child would cease to be just like an unsaved adult would cease to be. And it's uh, each one of us um, have responsibility uh, um, as each one of us are placed under the law of God to keep the law. We were married to the law of God. And if we transgress and offend the law at any point, we're guilty and we're subject to the, the penalty that the law states, which is um, to be killed. The wages of sin is death. And, and so God is no respecter of persons. Um, a child or a father, each one dies for their own sin. As, as Deuteronomy 24 says, the father shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin and and that's how it's always been that's the case 
with all that have ever come under God's wrath um, as a result of their sin, no one died and, and um, experienced the wrath of God because of their father's sin. It's, it's never the father's fault or the mother's fault. It's the individual's fault. Now, I'm not sure if I can explain um, Deuteronomy 5.9 right now um, as far as this reference to visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. We know it has to be um, in harmony with what we read in Deuteronomy 24.16, but I'm not exactly sure if I can explain this. But thank you for bringing up that verse or those verses. And do we have another question? Well, it, 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 you know, I, I have some ideas and we could all speculate, but um, I, I'd rather just wait and take a look at it, um, you know, more carefully. Uh, this same person asked how much, there's another question after this, but how much is the cost to go to Ecuador? We estimate the cost is right now about $1,300. It's an estimate. Um, uh, because we haven't we haven't gotten the airfare or the hotel, uh, but we've we've looked into it and it seems to be about thirteen hundred. But it could go up or down uh, a little bit from that. Okay. The next question is: Most of all of our family and friends are still members of a church. However, some disagree with much of the church's teaching. Is it possible that some of these individuals may be considered? by God to have left the church spiritually prior to May, May uh, 21, 2011 and are saved even though they are still considered by the church to be members of the congregation? Uh, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. If you're saying that there's people going to church but they don't agree with the church's teaching, that uh, they're, they're going to church. And the fact that they're going to church is... Um, a disobedient act to what God commanded to to flee the church to depart out uh, but a as far as that you know we can leave some of those questions uh, is there an individual who's on the church's role who hasn't been in the church we'll, we'll just leave that with, with the Lord um, I, I don't know you know I, I think we'll just leave it at that okay yes hello so, my dad, you know you. Yeah, I know George. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, he wanted to know if Daniel 12, verse 3, related to um, stars falling from heaven and no salvation. Daniel 12. George has his ways, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Daniel 12, verse 1. <laughs> and at that time shall Michael stand up. The great prince would stand it for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And what's the question again? <laughs> that turn many to righteousness shall be as stars. So therefore, when the stars fall from heaven, there will not be no more turning many to righteousness. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness. Oh, oh. Well, that, that is possible. That is possible that God used his people to bring the gospel, and, and that was part of the gospel lights, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And these lights all involve the gospel, but we know the stars fall. And... 
um, at, at this time. Actually, it says, I think, in Joel, that the stars withdraw their shining. That's an interesting way of putting it, as though it were a conscious act on the part of the stars. And it also says that the moon will not give her light, as though the moon and the moon would represent the word of God, the law. God is intentionally not giving the light that would shine forth. The believers understand this, recognize this, withdraw their shining. And that's exactly what many of the Lord's people have done by not going out with tracks to give anyone um, the idea that God is still saving and so forth. We have agreed with what we've learned from the Bible and withdrawn our shining. And, and yes, um, that's how God did turn people to righteousness or to salvation through the lights of the gospel. So I, I think it, it could be related. Yes, thank you. Um, Chris, I want to turn, Chris, I want to know if you can turn to uh, Ezekiel 47, uh, verses 1 to 6, and explain that to me. Ezekiel 47. Verse 1 to 6. All right, verse 1. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, water is issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through. The waters were to the loins. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Well, this, this uh, is, um, I think, pointing to the gospel water that was abundant in the time of the latter rain. There, there is a scripture, I think, in, well, in, in the Bible that says that the, um, the, the word of God would cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And, and so the waters are issuing forth from the house of God, the spiritual house, not the churches. And, and they're getting deeper and deeper because it's an abundance of gospel water that was available during the second part of the Great Tribulation. Now, we can know it's that because um, it later on speaks of people fishing and it, it says wherever the waters go, that it, they bring life. And for instance, in verse 9, And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. For they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. Remember the great catch of fish in John 21? A great multitude pointing to the great multitude that was saved out of the great tribulation. I think? Uh, yeah, my second question is, um, I was wondering if you could tell me what does the Bible say about uh, prosperity and healing, like uh, healing for your sin sick soul or healing from your body or from um, any kind of diseases, you know? Uh, well, or, 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 mm, by, or, or, well, God... Says about that. In James 5, in James 5, it says in um, verse 14, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. In the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, 
Is that true? Even during the church age, if you were sick and you called for an elder of the church and, and the elder would come and they would anoint you with oil, it, would, it, would it be like it says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick and sins would be forgiven? The church, Has that the church ever came happened? with that idea. The church came up with that idea. They looked at the scripture and used to put their own interpretation to say that God say that God does say that God heals sick. Like a person who falls in a person in a wheelchair, that person put their hands on and healed them, and that person comes out of the wheelchair like that. Yeah. Well, they, 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 well, they, well they, that's that's what they want people to think that God is healing the sick because that's a big business. It, it's like medicine in the world is a huge business. Hospitals um, do a great amount of business because they heal sick people. And so the church has veered off into that area. And, and some of them, not all, but they, they try to make like they can perform healings. Because look, it says here in James 5. But see, this, this is another passage that teaches us how God wrote the Bible. And he wrote it to resist people who want to read the Bible literally. And if you take this literally, and I was a part of a church where a friend of mine had cancer, and the pastor came and anointed him with oil. Did his cancer get better? No. It didn't get any better. Why not? And it, Because no one's ever gotten better who is anointed with oil. It, it's spiritually referring to the elders coming with the word of God, the gospel, sharing the gospel with the sin-sick individual, and it could be that God anoints that person with the Holy Spirit, which is typified by the oil, and, and the prayer of faith is the Lord Jesus. Remember, he's faith. It takes his prayer. I pray not for the world. I pray for them which I have called out of the world. It takes the prayer of faith to save the sinner. And then everything fits and, and everything agrees with everything else in the Bible. But when people insist that you have to read the Bible literally, well, they end up far away from truth. What about but thank you, what thank about you, prosperity? Lester. Did you mention anything about prosperity? Because I mentioned that too. Prosperity. Well, well, prosperity, yes, there's prosperity, gospels, and it's the same idea because we can read verses where God um, mentions uh, wealth or prosperity. And, and, well, I don't know if I remember it, um, either in Second John or in Third John. Um, in, in verse 2, 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, there's both of them, even as thy soul prospereth. So it'll take a verse like this. You see, it's God's will that you be prosperous. And that's, that's a, a, a very alluring kind of gospel for unregenerate people, for people who are in the flesh. Because, well, now I can get help. Now I can go to God and uh, I can get the car I want, the house I want, the <laughs> bank account I want, exactly. and so forth. And they have people who will, you know, encourage individuals in that way. But God doesn't care. He doesn't care how much our bank account is or what kind of car we drive, if we even have a car. You know, God has people who, who are barefoot in some parts of the world, and they can't afford shoes. And, and what's wrong with them? There's nothing wrong with them. But if they're saved, they're prosperous. Remember Lazarus, the, the, the beggar? He wasn't doing too well physically. He had sores and the dogs licked them. And he, he desired the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. But who was prosperous? Truly, it was Lazarus because his soul prospered through salvation and that's the important thing. It doesn't matter. And we can get caught up in that. We can be deceived, like it says in Psalm 73. And we look around and we envy the wicked. And uh, these things are so shiny today, so bright. 
and they're shiny and bright in order to attract our attention. So we do look and we lust and we envy. And it says in Psalm 73, and that was a man of God, I envied until I went into the sanctuary of the Lord and then understood I their end. And, and I, I remember using this years ago that uh, I, when, when I was working at Vanguard, I tell you, if you, you um, at that time, it was, it was Bill Gates, the, a billionaire. And the way people talk about him, the way people love the, his riches, they really love his riches. Well, if you take a multi-billionaire and you can look at everything he has and, and all the tremendous riches, family, house, clothing, food, everything anybody could want. And then that same person one morning gets up, trips on um, one of his child's toys, um, skate or something at the top of the stairs, comes tumbling down the steps, breaks his neck, and he's on life support, and he has a very short time to live, but he's still alive. Would you change places with him? Why not? He still has the money. He still has the house. He still has the cars. He still has everything that people envy and want. Why wouldn't you trade places with him? Because you know his end. You know he has a short time. So it would be foolish to substitute where you are with him. And, and that's what God would have us to know. And even if it's longer than 1,600 days, Still, it's a temporal period of time. However long we live on earth, it's a little time period, and the end will come, and then all will be gone, and, and, and uh, it will be shown as, as truth that the one that waited on the Lord, the person who maybe didn't have anything but waited on the Lord, was the one who was truly rich, like Lazarus. Uh, thank you. I don't, I don't have a question, but I don't have a question, but I can I, uh, address the earlier caller about uh, Deuteronomy 5, when it talks about uh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of homework that goes into that word visiting. It's relating to judgment. But um, when he talks about the, the fathers upon the children, I think we should have to uh, consider Second Thessalonians 2, where it talks about... Uh, those that love not the truth is parallel language with uh, Deuteronomy 5 where it says, of them that hate me. It's parallel to that. And then it says that God will send strong delusion. And so it uh, talks about the fa visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. We also have to consider uh, where God talks about, uh, ye are of your father, the devil. And this, the father, in this case, could be Satan. Visiting the iniquity of the father upon the children. Except it's plural. And, and, well, it's plural here, only, but we, again, I'm just saying we could look into that. I don't know if it's, it's exactly well, plural well, in that case. Oh, okay, so, yeah, and that's what we want to do. We want to think about it, and we want to look at possibilities and pray for wisdom, and of course, compare Scripture with Scripture, and uh, if it's God's will, he'll, he'll open up our understanding to truth. But thank you. Uh, Rich? Chris, could you compare John 15:6? To Revelation fourteen fifteen, John fifteen six. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire; and they are burned. And and Revelation fourteen fifteen. Yes, yes, please. And another angel came out of the temple, crying, with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. The word withered in John 15, 6, and the word ripe in Revelation 14, they're the same Greek word. And, um, and my, my question is, is that this, this time frame is talking about the end of the Great Tribulation when... The, they, they're gathered together, they're reaped, and they're thrown into the fire. And then now at this time, the reaping is occurring 
for the believers during this entire time of Judgment Day. Is that correct? Asking two uh, questions there. Uh, yeah, can you like <laughs> Let me go back. Or? The first part, in these two particular verses, it's, is it referring to the fact that the, um, the believers are being used by God to gather together um, the unsaved to be thrown into the fire up until May 21st? In, in John 15? Yes. And in Revelation 14. I'm thinking they're very similar or if not the same time frame that it's talking about. Well, uh, the word abide is an important word. It, it's actually um, the focus of John 15. It's used so many times throughout verses 4 through 11. And it's a word that, that means continue. Okay. Like in John eight thirty one, if ye continue in my word, right. if you ab- if you abide, and so this is saying the same thing. If a man abide not or continue not in me, and Jesus is the word. Right. So if you do not continue in the word, he the individual doesn't do that. Is cast forth as a branch and withered, and and then men gather them and cast them into the fire. So we. At the beginning of May 21, or at the beginning of judgment on May 21, 2011, the churches we know were separated and, and all that remained were bundled as tares, cast into the fire. And then judgment day began and a process got underway where God began severely trying the individuals outside of the churches to see who was gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble. And, and in this process, those not continuing are, in a sense, uh, being cast into the fire. God's people will abide. They will continue throughout the entire period. So, but, the, but they, by the sowing of the seed that was spread, that's what gather when they didn't show forth any fruit, that's what eventually throws them into the fire. Um cast alive into the but, fire? But you don't or? know that. Okay, that's You fine. don't know that until they stop continuing, continuing. in the Word. Okay. They're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. Okay. And, and, and going back to the world, to the church, and so forth. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Yes. Uh, I'd just like to add uh, to the verses that the gentleman just read. Job 14, 7 through 9. Job 14, <laughs> 7 through 9. Verse 7, for there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease, though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground. Yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth bows like a plant but man dieth and wasteth away yea man giveth up the ghost and where is he um, in light to the study that you had this morning and those verses the tree which is Christ yeah. as he indwells his elect um, they will bring forth branches even the scent of the word the water the gospel because Christ himself, the tree, uh, he is the one that indwells his people and he in- causes them to endure to the end. Yeah, I, I looked at that passage about hope of a tree and I, I think it may relate to to the Lord. I think you might be right about that. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you, Chris. Um, as a Revelation 1420 uh, indicates the uh, possibly the final stage of God's judgment upon, upon the world and harmonizing that with Revelation 21, 27 and 22, 15 I was reading Revelation 22 2 and 3 can perhaps also this um, verses in Revelation 22 point to the completion of purification and sanctification of the elect because those verses speak of the healing of the uh, uh, nations that um, 
from coming from the tree, uh, the leaves of the tree. <clears throat> I think that's language of salvation. Um, as we were looking at earlier in, in Third John, may you prosper, be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Health, uh, wellness points to salvation, healing. When Jesus performed the miracles, he was healing people. He would give sight to the blind, ears to the deaf, legs to the lame. Healing them in, in all those cases points to salvation. Because I also went from also to verse 14 of Revelation 22 and 15, because in verse 14 it speaks of um, yeah. the elect having well, the right. Let me read these verses yes. and then you can ask your question. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I was seeing a connection between 22, 2 and 3 and 22, 14 and 15. Yes, I do understand about the healing. Uh, we've learned that. And I would just see this as the final stage when, because see, in 3, in Revelation 22, 3, says nothing at first uh, will be entering in the new Jerusalem, in the new, uh, in, in the new temple, I mean, in the, in the new well, city. Well, uh, all and God's elect are saved yeah. and, and have the tree of life yeah. in that sense. Okay. But we're also here, still living on the earth at this time of judgment, going through a tableau of our own, demonstrating that we had died in Christ from the foundation of the world. We're appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. And during this time, it's very important. Uh, blessed are they that do his commandments. Because what is God's commandment? What is, if you had to think in the Bible of a particular commandment, that especially applies to the days after the tribulation, what would it be? Well, it's the emphasis that Jesus put upon feed my sheep three times in John 21. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And that is his commandment, especially to us, that we must continue with continue. that task of feeding sheep. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, so, and, and it, uh, true believers will do the will of God. We will keep his commandments because he's given us a heart that desires to do so and the ability to do so and those that are not true believers will not keep his commandments they'll they'll fail what i was looking was for the, is there a point of that the bible indicates the point of purification and in in verse 4 in in the end on in revelation 22 just like in revelation 14:20 it indicates the end, the final stage of judgment upon the world. I thought that maybe in, in Revelation 22, we could find the final stage, the completion of the purification. But I understand what you're saying. Well, I, I understand. Yeah, the, um, there is a, a big emphasis at this time on keeping God's Yes, hands. all right, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you for bringing up those verses. And let's go to Paltal. Uh, the question is, when handing out tracts, I was approached by a gentleman who asked me if God created sin. I told him that God is the creator. Can you answer this? What? Can you answer whether uh, about the question if God created sin? Well, no. God created mankind, and mankind is responsible for his own actions. We were all uh, accountable, every one of us, for the things we do. And, and God didn't make Adam and Eve sin. He knew they would sin. He did allow them to sin. There's a big difference between allowing, as God, for instance, allowed uh, some of the angels to sin, and they fell. But God withheld many of the other angels from sinning. They never sin, and they remain in heaven. So God, um, he lifted his hand of restraint from Pharaoh. 
Pharaoh sins. Did God cause Pharaoh to sin? Pharaoh sinned. It was his sin. But as far as God not restraining it, well, that was in his will. And, and he could uh, have things or circumstances work out as he intended them to work out. Likewise, God created man, Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve fell into sin, and God permitted this to happen, but it was Adam and Eve's own sin. We can't blame God. We can't blame anybody else. If we have done wrong, it's our fault. It's not our father's fault. It's not anybody's fault. It's not God's fault. And that is the tendency for people to want to blame somebody else. And if we blame somebody else, we justify our own self. What did, um, uh, let, let's go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. And uh, it says in verse 9, And Jehovah God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Or have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So God asked Adam, Does he just say, Yes, I ate of the tree? No. No. The woman that you gave me. <laughs> so it's a, a way of trying to justify his wrong. And, and then in verse 13, And Jehovah God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So I can't point back to Adam. But who else is there? The serpent. It's the serpent's fault. And it is our natural inclination to want to blame somebody. Just anybody who's had children knows that. When, when somebody does something wrong in the house, what's the first thing they say? He did it. <laughs> or she did it. it. It's our natural tendency to want to blame somebody else. But the Bible, God of the Bible, won't let us. He keeps pointing the finger at the individual, at each one. That's what the Bible does. You are the guilty one. You are the sinner. You are the one who has broken my law. But you, you, you. That's the, the incessant um, declaration of the Bible. It's why people don't like reading the Bible, because the Bible was given to show us our sin. And as we keep reading, it keeps showing us more and more law, and that means more and more law we've broken, more sin, and it's either uh, we, we become broken before God and humbled before Him, or we escape from the, um, the wrath of God as the finger of God keeps pointing at us and showing us our guilt. But yes. I'm curious about uh, Adam and Eve being made in God's image, made without sin, like we are. We carry the original sin from Adam and Eve. And God said, if you do what I say, you live forever. If you don't, now they had a free will and they had salvation if they stayed good, which we don't have. Well, they didn't have salvation because they didn't need salvation he said, at that point. Did, well, what did they have? They, they had were, life. Everlasting life. Because the day you sin... Conditional life. The day you if, sin against right, me, you shall surely die. Keeping the commandments. And, and God only gave very uh, few commandments. Here is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Do not eat. If they kept that, they had the option of living forever. They didn't have original sin. So they had a free will. They had everlasting life if they just 
did what he said. We don't have that option. We are born with sin. So are they different than us in, in relationship for a better shot at salvation? Well, it, let, let's go to Romans 7. I think Romans 7 gets into that. Let's see. It says in verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And it's, it's uh, very likely... Paul is figuring himself as man in the very beginning, alive without the commandment. That's the only time we can say man was alive. But then God gave the commandment, thou shalt not eat of this tree. And, and then sin revived and he died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death for sin taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Now, I, I, I see what you're saying. You're saying, well, Adam and Eve were alive without sin. They sinned, and, and yet all generations of men that come from them are born in sin, were conceived in sin. Psalms tell us we're born speaking lies. Is it fair? Is it just? Well, the Bible also sets up figureheads. Remember when we read of Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek and, and it says that Levi was in his loins at the time that was done. Well, all of us were in the loins of Adam, Adam and, and our first parents when they committed sin. We were there. We bear responsibility uh, in that sense that as, as God looks out at the human race, Adam was our figurehead and what happened to him happened to us all. And so we, we have to acknowledge we would have done the same thing. Any one of us, nobody would have been able to um, keep the law perfectly uh, in a way that Adam and Eve could not. We all would have done the very same thing. So God pronounced the judgment on mankind, and then we die for our own sin because the baby conceived in sin is born speaking lies. Have you ever thought about that? How is that possible? Do babies speak when they're born? They don't speak. They, they can uh, say, make a couple sounds and cry, but they can't speak. Well, why does God say they're born speaking lies because in their heart in their soul existence they're already saying as the bible says that man says in his heart there is no god and and that's uh, it's a transgression that is that is born within mankind at the very beginning of of man's conception in sin it, and and it, this is on a level we don't understand but god understands it God sees it, and so he, uh, he makes that declaration. All babies are born speaking lies, and to speak lies is sin. And um, it, it's something that we're all guilty of, and none of us can say that, um, uh, that we would have done any different or that God is unjust in any way for bringing his wrath upon us for our sin. Okay, um, one last question from Pal Talk. Question is in Second Peter three twelve. Can we understand the phrase "the heavens being on fire" to be past tense rather than future tense? Looking and for. And there's a follow up too. Sorry. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now we don't have a problem understanding this because. Everything that's happening is happening within the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord 
The day of judgment is a prolonged period of time from May 21, 2011 through, there's a good likelihood, October 7th, 2015. So God can bring a spiritual judgment for 1,599 of those days. And then on the last day, October 7th, he can destroy the world with fire and it all happened in the day of the Lord. Um, so there, it, it's all in keeping with how God has revealed a prolonged judgment day, it, that it's not a single day. And once we understand that, a lot of these passages begin to make sense. I would like to mention the word looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. And here God is telling his people that we are not only permitted to look for his coming, but it, it can be an intense look. This is the same word that's found in Acts 28 when the venomous beast latched on to Paul's hand and he shook it off into the fire. And then the natives looked for quite a while at Paul to see if he would fall down dead. And after a while, after a great while, I think it says, they changed their mind that he wasn't a murderer, that, that um, uh, providence had not allowed to live, but rather he was a god. And, and it's that word looking that God is using here to describe looking into the coming of the day of God, which the people of God are privileged to do. God permits this. Um, he, of course, would have us to do this. We are free to search the Bible to find whatever that he, he would reveal to us. All right, we'll stop here, and let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all your blessings to us once again. And we thank you for uh, your word. We pray that you would uh, bless the track trip to Ecuador, that you would uh, be with the people that are going and with the people that are there, that uh, your word might find those that you, you want it to find and that it might be a source of help and comfort to people uh, in that country. And Father, we pray for people all over the world, and we ask that uh, you might open up even more opportunities to reach more and more people. And we pray that uh, you, would, you would give us wisdom in everything we do and, and guide us step by step. And Father, we pray uh, for the rest of today. We ask that you would be with us as we travel home, be with those that are going far, long distances. We ask that you would uh, be with them in their travels and, and bless their families and their houses. And may uh, you uh, give us wisdom towards our own children and, and others in our family. And we ask for your blessing, though we don't deserve it, but only for Christ's sake. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.